Good afternoon and welcome to today's CME activity. There is no commercial support. The um, speakers and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial relations, uh, with any commercial interest related to the presentation. If you have a question for the presenter and you're viewing online, please enter it into the Q&A chat and we'll ask at the end of the presentation. And if you're viewing, if you're here in person, you will receive a SurveyMonkey evaluation <coughs> link before you leave. And if you're viewing online, you will see that in the links icon in the description section of the video. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Cotez. He is an associate professor at Emory University School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He is director of the Clinical and Research Program for Psychosis at Grady Health System, which comprises of two clinical programs. The first one being the uh, Persistent Sy Symptoms Treatment Assessment and Recovery, PSTAR Clinic, and um, Project Arrow, which is Achieving Recovery Through Resilience, Optimism, and Wellness. The PSTAR Clinic provides evidence-based recovery-oriented care for individuals with persistent symptoms of psychosis, specializing in the use of clozapine. Project Arrow is a coordinated specialty care team for people experiencing early psychosis, offering comprehensive person-centered centered care using a multidisciplinary approach. He is a member of the clinical expert team for SMI Advisor, which is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and administered by the American Psychiatric Association. SMI Advisor provides evidence-based resources to clinicians, individuals with serious mental illness, and their families. Dr. Cotez is an investigator for multiple research studies focused on treatment options for psychosis. His research focuses on clozapine and early psychosis. Join me in welcoming Dr. Cotez. All right. Well, so wonderful to be here. Uh, thanks to Dr. Prasad for the invitation. Um, hello to everyone joining on Zoom. Uh, so I'm really delighted to talk with you all about clozapine. I promise you that ChatGPT didn't come up with the title for this talk, Red Tape to Recovery. That's all me. Um, I'm, I'm really very focused on clozapine. I, I want to, um, I guess, you know, over the course of this talk, I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, you walk away from this feeling more comfortable how to use clozapine and less sort of hesitant to start clozapine for a new patient who might benefit from it. Um, I, I work with uh, an initiative called SMI Advisor, which is funded by SAMHSA and is implemented by the American Psychiatric Association, half of my time as physician expert. And in that role, I do a lot of um, work on clozapine, uh, co-direct the uh, National Clozapine Center of Excellence and uh, do a lot of psychopharmacology consults, particularly around clozapine and other issues. So is anybody familiar with SMI Advisor? Yeah, so it's, uh, if you go to smiadvisor.org, there's a free, um, it's a free website. You don't have to be an APA member. It has a bunch of CMEs. Um, we have a bunch of uh, activities around clozapine and evidence-based uh, psychosocial and pharmacologic interventions for people with SMI. So I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, you can also write a consult. Um, so before I started the talk today, I did uh, three consults um, about all kinds of different stuff, but mostly psychopharmacology issues. We usually get back to you within 24 business hours. All right, uh, here are some disclosures. Um, none are really relevant to this work. Uh, I'm a consultant to Saladex Biomedical, which makes an amino assay for clozapine levels which we're gonna talk a little bit about. And um, you can see my other disclosures here. We're gonna talk about three main things, um, efficacy, underutilization, and patient selection. Then we're gonna talk about considerations in using clozapine most effectively. And then we'll talk about uh, the red tape part of this, or clozapine REMS, the risk evaluation and mitigation system uh, that the FDA has for clozapine. Um, if anybody has questions throughout the talk, just let me know and, and we can stop and I'll repeat your question and uh, we can uh, address it and we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So I think that when you think about 
uh, clozapine, patient selection is really, really important. And the APA schizophrenia guidelines were published and updated in 2020. And they actually have three places where clozapine uh, finds itself um, in terms of suggestions or recommendations. And we're gonna go through each of these. So the first two are clozapine's FDA indications. The first one is kind of like treatment resistant schizophrenia and the second one is uh, to help reduce suicidal behavior in people with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. So we're gonna go through those, starting with the treatment resistant schizophrenia criteria. And I think what's important to understand is that treatment resistant schizophrenia or TRS is probably a misnomer. Actually, um, it likely represents a subset of schizophrenia for people whose biology is slightly different that they just don't tend to respond well to dopamine D2 blockers, conventional dopamine D2 blockers. So we, we really think that um, we would love to see a different name for TRS than what we have now. And a lot of these people are actually clozapine responsive. So it makes no sense that they're called sort of treatment resistant schizophrenia patients. So if you work with schizophrenia patients, you should know that about a quarter of these folks will have treatment resistant schizophrenia. And if you're not thinking about clozapine for a quarter of your schizophrenia patients, then I don't know, maybe you're seeing a different group Maybe you're not, but the literature seems to indicate that about a quarter of patients with schizophrenia have treatment resistant schizophrenia. Uh, and if you look at prospectively at first episode cohorts, um, one nice meta-analysis suggested that the rate of TRS was 23% among uh, recently diagnosed patients moving, kind of looking forward. TRS has an interesting um, kind of uh, natural history. About 60% of people with TRS actually develop TRS right after the onset of uh, psychotic symptoms. And they just don't tend to respond well to antipsychotic medications. The other 40% likely develop TRS over time. And that means that there may be some component of dopamine supersensitivity that leads to um, antipsychotics not working as well for them. These are the people who are gonna start antipsychotics, stop antipsychotics, uh, maybe have relapses, there may be something to um, that stopping and starting thing that may lead to the development of TRS actually. Some research criteria um, from the TRIP working group was published. Um, and you know, I think that a problem is getting caught up in the details of the TRIP uh, TRS criteria. We kind of deal with this in the research side a little bit more, but the main thing to know is that these are people who haven't responded adequately to two antipsychotic medications despite taking the medication. Okay, and I think that even recently, data from the optimized study suggests that even after one antipsychotic failure, the likelihood that somebody's gonna to respond to a second one is quite low. Um, so, you know, as you heard in the introduction, I run a first episode program. We talk to people about clozapine quite a bit after the first antipsychotic failure, uh, and it's on their radars. I think I have about, um, you know, a, a number of patients on clozapine in our early psychosis program. And actually early psychosis programs are really the best places to really calculate the number of antipsychotic trials and, and um, you know, provide early access to clozapine. Clozapine is really the only medication that you would expect to work for people with TRS. Like you could give people other medications, but it just turns out that they're not all that effective. You know, the 10% and atypical antipsychotics is really more like 7% for high dose olanzapine. Uh, other atypical antipsychotics are unlikely to work. Clozapine doesn't work for everybody. Clozapine probably works for about half of people. We'll have, you know, meet response criteria, um, significant reduction on a PANS or something like that. And then we know that clozapine is gonna be more effective for short-term and long-term uh, for people with TRS. It's also the most effective antipsychotic medication for people with schizophrenia, not just for TRS. And then patients, if you ask them, uh, prefer being on clozapine in comparison to the other antipsychotics that they've been on. Tips for identifying TRS patients. So 
it makes pretty good sense that if a medication is not working for someone, they might be unlikely to take it. So when you see people on the inpatient unit, one of the things they come in most commonly with with schizophrenia is a recent lack of medication adherence. And the knee-jerk reaction is to simply restart them on an antipsychotic they were taking before. But what you need to really think through is, did they have a degree of uh, positive symptoms, particularly once they were taking the antipsychotic medication they were prescribed? So we often, you know, really focus on when people are on LAIs, did they have a component of persistent symptoms at that time? Um, you know, in our early psychosis program, uh, we were involved with a study called the Prelapse Study that looked at um, long-acting aripiprazole for first episode patients that found, you know, significantly decreased risk of relapse. So we use a lot of LAIs in our first episode program. And it turns out that, you know, if people are having persistent symptoms on an LAI, it's a great clue that they're a clozapine candidate. Also, some people are very sensitive to extrapyramidal side effects. Uh, that's another clue. Um, okay, let's talk about a couple of other clues here. Um, as far as who responds well to clozapine, it turns out that the earlier you introduce clozapine, the better off people are going to end up doing. So um, in North America, people are often, they often have pretty significantly delayed time uh, until they get clozapine, five to nine antipsychotic medications. We need to make that two, two antipsychotic medications. And you can just see the delay, if the delay is less than 2.8 years, the response is about 80%. If the delay is more than 2.8 years, the response rate is much lower, 30%. So people with TRS make up about a quarter um, of people with schizophrenia. And then about 4.8% of people with schizophrenia are on clozapine in the US. So we like to call this 18% the clozapine underutilization gap. The only way we're gonna um, fix this is by starting new patients on clozapine. You may continue clozapine for people that have been started on it elsewhere, which I think is good, but it's the new starts that really matter in closing this gap. And we're going to talk a little bit about some considerations for how do you start clozapine for folks. Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far on TRS? Identifying TRS patients. Okay, so the second um, guideline uh, recommendation for clozapine use is schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder patients who are at high risk for suicide or have had suicide attempts. It's an FDA package insert. Um, and, you know, Overall, people with schizophrenia are just much more likely to um, complete suicide. Some people would say the lifetime risk is around 5%. Some studies even say as high as 10%. Suicidal ideation, suicide attempts is common. Um, up to 40, 50% of people with schizophrenia will have a suicide attempt. People are more likely to commit suicide early in their, um, early after the diagnosis. And we know that from the intercept study, uh, clozapine was associated with far less suicidal behavior than olanzapine was in a big study. Um, this has also been seen in naturalistic studies um, in which clozapine was the only antipsychotic associated with decreased risk of suicide. We recently published a study um, looking at, that kind of did a, a, a different sort of methodology because suicide is a hard thing to study. Uh, it's a fairly, fortunately, it's a fairly rare outcome. And if you do sort of randomize people and then look prospectively, it's a, it can be difficult. So we looked at a group of, um, we, we looked at the uh, Maryland office of the chief medical officer for people who had died. And interestingly, in the state of Maryland, they get therapeutic drug monitoring for everybody, uh, you know, who, who is, um, 
possibly taking an antipsychotic. So you get levels of everything. Uh, very rare. And we found that people um, were much more likely to die by suicide when olanzapine was in their system in comparison to clozapine. And that's using accidents as a uh, comparison. So it's sort of a, a new way of, of looking at this. Um, check it out. This was published a couple weeks ago in Journal Clinical Psychiatry. And I think it's just sort of more converging evidence that there's sort of a, um, an anti-suicide benefit for clozapine. This is the clinic that um, we developed in 2012, which focuses on clozapine. It's called P-STAR. Uh, we've had 500 referrals since 2016, and then only 4% have been referred for suicidal behavior for people with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Most of the time, 95% of the time, it's TRS or second opinion. So put this on your, um, you know, put this on the map of something to consider for clozapine patients. You know, there is a, a very clear um, body of literature that suggests that people with schizophrenia are much more likely to die prematurely than those in the general population, 20 years, 15 years. But it turns out that people on clozapine actually um, have a significantly decreased mortality risk compared to other antipsychotics, which is interesting because clozapine has some of the most significant cardiometabolic side effects. So part of this could be related to clozapine's anti-suicidality benefit. Um, also, what you see is when people's positive symptoms are better controlled, they tend to you know, engage more in life and kind of do the other things that might help to reduce mortality. Socialization, exercise, things like that. Okay, now for the third time, which you can consider using clozapine. Um, and when the risk of aggressive behavior remains substantial despite other treatments. This is a slightly lower uh, level of evidence than the first two, but can be quite beneficial for people who are quite aggressive um, or have um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe attacked um, people on the inpatient unit. We've seen, seen the use of this in the state hospitals for this sort of purpose. There's actually a big R01 right now looking at this um, from NMH. Um, some of the literature that kind of talks about this is um, Physically assaultive schizophrenia patients were randomized to clozapine, olanzapine, or haloperidol. Clozapine had significantly less um, assaults uh, for those who were on clozapine. And it's more, it, it's not just sort of a sedation effect, olanzapine pre-sedating. Those with conduct disorder um, before the onset of schizophrenia, uh, it, it turned out that that even had a higher likelihood uh, for clozapine to be helpful for. Okay, any questions on when to use clozapine? Another group I, I really think about a lot are there these, there are these folks who you might be seeing in the outpatient clinic who are just like not really kind of getting to accomplish their goals. They're like just on the precipice of doing what they want to do, but something's holding them back. And when that thing is subtle positive symptoms, these are great clozapine ca candidates, I think. Okay. Um, how to start clozapine, considerations for that. You know, I think that there's often an inverse relationship between um, the amount of time we spend discussing something and then the frequency of the side effect. So we talk about, you know, things like severe neutropenia a lot, and we don't talk about things that are very common, like sedation or sialuria very much. And when you're talking to somebody about clozapine, you really want to um, balance its potential life-changing benefits with its side effect profile. And I've seen residents have this conversation many, many times, hundreds of times actually. And what you see is they'll say, okay, I want to sit down and I want to talk about the five boxed warnings. And then by the time that patient gets out of there, they're like, I am never taking clozapine. I'm never talking to this person again. I am just like, I'm scared beyond belief. And what happens in those cases is these people are not talking about the potential benefits enough. So I really think it's important to kind of have a balanced discussion of that. Um, you know, 
Titrating clozapine has been an area of a little bit of controversy. Um, I think that um, slow titrations are probably safer and are more likely to result in the patient staying on clozapine than fast ones. We really wanted to have a paper called The Tortoise Beats the Hare in some context. And this was the opportunity to do that. So um, we wrote this paper that kind of outlined the case for a slow clozapine titration. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the US package insert, it's really quite extreme. Uh, it suggests getting people to 300 or 450 milligrams of clozapine over two weeks, um, which is quite fast. So if you're just sort of a, you know, if you haven't used a lot of clozapine, maybe you'd look it up to date or maybe you look at the package insert. Um, but actually the package insert, I think could be quite harmful. And we're working on uh, changing that with uh, HLS therapeutics and other, and other um, you know, people who prescribe, people who make brand clozapine. One of the reasons that I think it's less safe is because rapid titrations are associated with an increased myocarditis risk. Um, and if you, there's, there's sort of an increased risk if you get to somebody to 300 milligrams over two weeks versus 200 milligrams over two weeks. And also, um, there's a group of people who respond quite well to low-dose clozapine, and you never know if you do a fast titration. If you look at various published, it's, you probably can't see the x-axis from where you are, but the bottom line is that the US package insert's probably a, a, an outlier in terms of titration speed for clozapine, and that most published sources suggest a slower titration. Um, let's see. So the one that we have on SMI Advisor suggests uh, 200 milligrams over two weeks. And that's usually what I recommend to people. And that's on an inpatient schedule. So inpatient titration should be faster than outpatient titrations. Um, just some ideas. Obviously, there's not one standard clozapine titration, but getting people to 200 milligrams over two weeks is probably safer than doing it faster than that. Uh, for the outpatient setting, we do a lot of new outpatient starts in P-STAR, and I like to get people to 100 milligrams over two weeks, sometimes even slower. It really kind of depends on the clinical urgency as well. Um, it's also helpful when you're telling people you know, just some expectations. We're planning to get you to 400 milligrams over seven weeks. This is exactly the plan that we're gonna be doing over that time period. Instead of, oh, we're gonna see how it goes. It's gonna be very slow titration. We don't really know what we're looking for. Uh, and to, th to that extent, like therapeutic drug monitoring can be quite helpful. Um, so, you know, clozapine is one of the antipsychotics where getting blood levels can really help you clinically. Um, the reference range is between 350 to 600 nanograms per mil. Uh, it turns out that about 25% of patients will respond to levels less than 350. But if you have somebody who's not responding, you wanna get their level over 350. And if you don't check a level, you're really never gonna know because sometimes you see zero levels. Um, it's also clear that the risk of ADRs increases over 1,000. This, this is seizures, you know, more sialuria, sedation. Um, and then there's this other question about what do you do for a level from 600 to 1,000? And I think the answer is continue to increase the dose provided tolerability is okay. Until you get to about 1,000. Um, there's significant intra and inter-individual variation with uh, clozapine levels. There's a concept called the coefficient of variance, which means that if you basically just kind of take the same level again and again for the same patient, you're gonna have a coefficient of variance of 30%. So you can expect some variation in the clozapine levels despite everything else being the same. And then just to sort of make that point more clear as far as the variation goes, a male smoker is gonna need twice the clozapine dose as a female non-smoker to get to 350. This is different than just sort of giving everybody four or six milligrams of risperidone. 
um, clozapine has, you know, there's pretty, uh, can, you know, just even these variables like sex and smoking status can really affect the amount of um, clozapine uh, in that, that's uh, sort of in the blood. Clozapine is metabolized uh, primarily by CYP1A2 in addition to other enzymes in the CYP system, uh, 3A4, 2D6. There's differences in how much each of these isoenzymes are used, but most people use a lot of CYP1A2 to break down clozapine into norclozapine. Norclozapine has a slightly longer half-life than clozapine does. So sometimes we look at the metabolic ratio. Uh, so divide the clozapine level by the norclozapine level, and it gives us some kinetic clues. Like if the metabolic ratio is less than 0.9, it means that the person's probably a smoker or they're ultra rapid metabolizer at 1A2. I think that also in, in sort of COVID era, we've learned a lot about infection and how that affects blood levels of uh, antipsychotic medications. If somebody has an infection, it's going to increase the it's going to increase the level, um, specifically one in which they have a fever. Uh, it's it's likely uh, we've seen it again and again with COVID. Um, anybody any any time comes into the um, emergency room, we recommend getting a clozapine level immediately, because uh, sometimes you see high levels, sometimes you see low levels. Uh, obviously, um, smoking can decrease the levels. And it's the aryl hydrocarbons in smoking that does that, not the nicotine itself. So vaping, patches, none of that affects clozapine levels. It's the smoking the cigarettes. Smoking cannabis and the smoke that's produced causes that reaction. There's a lot of other interactions as well. I mean, the other one I'd point out is ciprofloxacin. Like, don't let the clozapine patients get ciprofloxacin. Uh, it's going to increase the levels. It's a strong CYP1A2 inhib inhibitor. Reports of toxicity and even fatalities from that combination. Choose a different antibiotic. There's plenty others. Okay. A lot of places where you can get TDM, where it makes sense. Um, uncertain adherence, lack of response, um, adverse drug reactions, when there's other inducers or inhibitors on board. The, the old um, people who are pregnant switching from different preparations. These are all justifiable reasons to get an antipsychotic level. One antipsychotic level gives you just one antipsychotic level. Get at least two to three to establish a baseline. And then you can kind of see where it goes. You know, there is, there's this sort of emerging evidence that um, individuals of Asian ancestry require less clozapine than other, um, than potentially other groups. And our colleague, Jose de Leon, has been very interested in this. And he did a systematic review that found that the CD ratio was, um, you know, significantly greater in stable clozapine patients uh, of Asian ancestry versus those who are Caucasian. And there's been a recent publication uh, looking at six ancestry-based titration schedules um, for people who take clozapine based on sort of their racial ethnic status and then their metabolism status. So um, we've, de we've definitely seen cases where um, some patients of Asian ancestry have been prescribed clozapine and they've given and they've been given doses way too high without levels. And uh, it's led to, um, you know, toxicity, other bad outcomes. Yeah, so when do you get the first level? We like to get the first level at about 100 milligrams. And then we talk to the patient and kind of cross titrate with them, kind of a suggestion for the other antipsychotic, antipsychotics, because uh, there's often a few on board. Uh, we like to usually stop, um, you know, the most clozapine like antipsychotic first. Uh, so it's often Zyprexa, which we'll stop first and leave on the paliperidone or leave on the risperidone. Sometimes leave on the leave on the aripiprazole. Um, so pretty much the more antihistaminic or cholinergic it is, the more likely we are to stop that antipsychotic first if there's more than one. A shameless plug for the clozapine dose planner from SMI Advisor. Uh, this is a tool that you can check out 
smiadvisor.org backslash clozapine dose planner. And you can select if somebody's a smoker or a non-smoker, male, female status, what their weight is, their age, what the clozapine dose is, and then it'll predict the clozapine level for you. Or if you know what the level is, it will predict the dose. And this is sometimes helpful if you're um, you know, trying to figure out what, what dose do I need to get to somebody for 350 nanograms per mil. So when I start a new clozapine patient, I typically will pull up this calculator, put their variables in, show them and say, for you to get to 350, a level of 350, you're gonna need X dose. This is how we're gonna do the titration. And this also kind of populates in real time, so you can like change it with the sliders and you can kind of see how the concentration is affected. Um, there's other, um, you know, sort of PK um, modeling uh, algorithms out there, especially that have been published recently. But this is one uh, that's been um, pretty widely used. It's just an approximation. Okay, um, before we go on, questions about TDM, clozapine levels. I'm gonna get a question at some point, maybe at the end. Um, do initial monitoring. So this is what I like to do for, for monitoring clozapine. Um, we have weeks, uh, just kind of the first eight weeks. Obviously we're gonna be screening for neutropenia um, weekly for the first six months, then from every other week from uh, six to 12 monthly uh, after one year forever, uh, which is probably not necessary. Um, the vital signs, especially in the beginning, are quite important, especially for outpatient titrations. I also like to do an interstitial nephritis screening, getting a weekly serum creatinine uh, until week eight, and then myocarditis screening protocols, which you all probably use, uh, weekly troponin, IRT or high sensitivity troponin, CRP. Um, other people use different things like sometimes, you know, you might see, um, sometimes you may see a BNP or CKMB. I don't know. I, I just like to use troponin, CRP, and then um, increases of those um, to a certain um, level usually um, it has a pretty high sensitivity and specificity for myocarditis. I like to use the Ronaldson reference um, to kind of uh, establish those higher thresholds. You do see some benign CRP fluctuations sometimes for people who are on clozapine early in the titration. This is um, my worries on a page, you know, so what do I worry about and when? In the beginning, myocarditis, up to about a year, neutropenia the whole time, weight gain, and then after a year, I'm really worried about ileus. This is the most common reason that people die from clozapine, complications of ileus, not neutropenia, not myocarditis. Um, it's uh, sort of complications from ileus. And this is a preventable, preventable thing. And it doesn't happen to people until they've been on clozapine for a while and it's kind of insidious, and you don't think about it, and um, you know, gotta be very vigilant. We'll get back to that. So I wanna talk a little bit about neutropenia. This is some of the um, latest epidemiologic evidence for clozapine and neutropenia. These are numbers that I have firmly burned into my brain. 3.8% neutropenia, 0.9% severe neutropenia. Like when you're talking to a patient, you should talk about kind of the, the rate of severe neutropenia. And this is sort of the, um, from a Siskin meta-analysis, what some of the um, most updated numbers are. So, you know, if you do the monitoring schedule as you should, the risk of death due to neutropenia is one in 77,000, one in 7,700. So it's fairly low cause of mortality. There are times where severe neutropenia happens that's different than people having an ANC of zero. Okay, sometimes there are just sort of these benign blips. We need to stop the clozapine if, the, if it gets less than 500. 
Um, we do the monitoring, we consult hematology, but um, for whatever reason, this is likely a different thing than people who develop life-threatening agranulocytosis. This happens over the course of 10, 10 days to maybe two weeks where their ANC just goes to zero and they need to go to the hospital immediately. If you see somebody with an ANC of zero, send them to the hospital immediately. Um, okay, so when does this happen? It happens most likely one month after initiation and then 90% of cases occur at a year. Um, yeah, I, I think after a year, the risk of neutropenia kind of changes to what it is for other antipsychotic medications. So there's a question of whether or not lifelong hematologic monitoring is necessary. Happens all the time when somebody wants to go on a trip um, for maybe a couple of weeks. Like people on clozapine, that's difficult. And maybe it's not necessary. Okay, myocarditis. Yeah, I mean, everybody's worried about myocarditis. The incidence is somewhat unclear, probably because it's a difficult thing to detect. There's a lot of things that are probably myocarditis that are, you know, never diagnosed as myocarditis. And then there's a lot of things that people think are myocarditis that are probably not myocarditis. But it happens to probably around less than 1% of patients. Uh, our colleagues at uh, MCG did a study looking at myocarditis and they found the, ri the risk was about 4 to 5% in clozapine new starts of presumed myocarditis. That's a increase in CRP and troponin. But not all of these were confirmed myocarditis cases. The problem is that myocarditis looks a lot like a regular clozapine titration. So basically, you are seeing you know, low-grade fever, nonspecific symptoms, fatigue, um, but then if people start talking about chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, um, signs of heart failure, then like you probably need to get more worried. Always ask about this. Try to get vital signs as often as you can, specifically for outpatient titrations. We like to do this for the first eight weeks. The median time as listed here is 17 days. So it's really an early phenomenon. The um, diagnostic choice, the diagnostic test of, of choice is a cardiac MRI. And uh, it's hard to get cardiac MRIs for people who have suspected clozapine-induced myocarditis. Echoes don't really help you, but probably try to get one. Sometimes you see you know, evidence of decreased um, ejection fraction. Um, and we've written a lot about uh, successful myoc myocarditis rechallenges, especially like where it was sort of, a, you know, not uncle unclear if it was really myocarditis in the first place. Um, okay. Ileus. Yeah. So, you know, clozapine is um, due to its anticholinergic effects in the colon and throughout the gut, very, very, it just slows everything down slows the upper GI tract down, slows the lower GI tract down. People have a massively increased colonic transit time who take clo clozapine. This was a shocking study um, by Susanna Every Palmer and colleagues from New Zealand. They found the CTT on average was over 104 hours for people who were taking clozapine. Just really, uh, you know, a lot. I mean, and, and I think they even had to censor some of the data because they didn't think it would be as long as it was for some of the patients. Um, so it occurs likely in a level dependent fashion. The median time to developing ileus was 1500 days. Um, so it's the people who are doing well that you don't really think about have an issue. And then clozapine is associated with, um, you know, a two X increased risk of ileus, seven X increased risk of fatal ileus. If you add anticholinergic on this, you're going to really kind of see that also expand further. So like, don't give your patients on clozapine additional you know, cogentin or benztropine or Benadryl, you know, like it's just not necessary. Clozapine is the, it is the, the, the you know, ace of anticholinergic activity, you know, like people might be reluctant to part with their benztropine, but they don't need it, you know. Um, clozapine is doing all that for them. 
So you might ask, well, why does clozapine then cause sialuria if it's so anticholinergic? Well, it turns out that um, the, the way that the um, propodin and some submandibular glands are innervated, um, clozapine may have uh, you know, some, some sort of different effects there, and it may actually be an M4 agonist. Norclozapine may be an M4 agonist, which actually produces increased salivation rather than causing dry mouth. And people think it's maybe more the norclozapine than the clozapine that's causing the sialuria. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting picture. It's sort of generally anticholinergic, and then it's causing sialuria. Um, this is a management protocol from the state hospital in California that we like to use um, for people who take clozapine. Everybody needs to be on uh, prophylactic docusate um, and, and possibly uh, Senna. We have a very low threshold to add polyethylene glycol or Miralax. Um, we sometimes use that up to three times a day. And then if this stuff doesn't work, we consider using the secretagogues like linaclotide or lubaprostone, which is, an ex which is sort of a, an exercise in communicating with insurance companies and trying to make a case that, um, that, that people need these uh, sort of medications. They're very effective. Uh, so these are things like um, Linzess or Amatiza that have been looked at for uh, chronic opioid-induced constipation. They're great for clozapine-induced constipation. And once you have people on amatiza, you can often discontinue all the other stuff. Now, I mean, I get it. Like, when you're on clozapine, there's a lot of other meds that are, that are often suggested or offered, or you're probably taking a bunch of other medication anyway. And like adding the, the regimen, the bowel regimen, um, shouldn't ever feel like an afterthought. I mean, this needs to be, so when I start clozapine with people, I tell them, look, I want to prescribe the minimum amount of medication possible, but I'm just going to tell you, it's going to be more medication than probably either of us would like. We're going to be doing something for constipation. We're going to probably be doing something for sialuria. You may get a beta blocker for tachycardia. Um, th there's a lot, but really the bowel regimen is probably one of the most important things. Also, what's problematic too is that um, people with schizophrenia who are on clozapine, they don't have some of the same pain signaling that other people may have when they get constipated and uh, haven't evacuated for a while. So they're not gonna tell you about abdominal pain as much. Um, and then what you see is ileus. And you get, you know, so you really have to be quite vigilant about this. Oh yeah, so clozapine has the highest um, you know, risk of cardiometabolic uh, side effects um, than other antipsychotics, probably worse than lanzapine. Uh, this is a nice study um, by Pillinger that looks at uh, the antipsychotics compared to each other. You can see clozapine down there at the bottom. And um, you know, the, the predictors of antipsychotic-induced weight gain or AIWG include um, increased baseline body weight, male sex, and non-white ethnicity. So um, just sort of keep that in mind. You see rapid weight gain with clozapine for some people very early on in the titration, like even on the inpatient setting. I like to make sure we get weights for people on the inpatient unit. And you'll see that sometimes for clozapine patients when they're discharged, they gain 15 pounds. Um, so you have to be quite uh, vigilant about this. What do you do? Well, you know, you wanna make sure that there's nothing else on board that's giving them issues, like um, valproate. That's the really, really common one that also causes pretty significant weight gain. And it's also associated with other sort of hematologic issues when prescribed clozapine. I don't like to use uh, sodium valproate if I can avoid it for clozapine treated patients. Um, yeah, so you know, sometimes it helps to tell patients that we think that weight gain occurs uh, due to uh, dysfunction in satiety signaling. So what happens when you take these is they just cause um, increased appetite. You don't get the signaling that you're full. You keep eating, you keep eating. This then leads to all the other downstream complications of increased weight. So 
some people, it kind of resonates that if you, if you just sort of eat the regular caloric intake, you are unlikely to gain weight. The, you know, clozapine does this by increasing appetite, increasing caloric intake. It's not, it doesn't decrease the, beta, the basal metabolic rate. Uh, so we start everybody on metformin that will, um, that will take it. We try to get people to two grams of metformin per day. Uh, who take clozapine, just as a starting place. Um, and then there's the GLP-1 agonists. So many people have come to me and said, you know, uh, I want to be on a GLP-1 agonist. This is, you know, semaglutide or terzepatide or liraglutide. And these medications have not been studied all that much for clozapine and a AIWG. There's some case series but they work extremely well. And, incre and I, increasingly, we've been using GLP-1 agonists to help mitigate AIWG with um, impressive results, uh, particularly with terzepatide. Uh, so there's like a dose-dependent effect with terzepatide. Um, and I think once you get people to 15 milligrams of terzepatide, you really see a lot of weight loss. Um, there are other issues uh, to consider with GLP-1 agonists, including the GI side effects. So you really have to kind of titrate them slowly, uh, keep a close watch. It's an off-label kind of thing. Um, many of people with, um, who are on clozapine already have an increased BMI and one other uh, sort of condition like hypertension. And that's like, a, you know, a, a, that's sort of the FDA indication for using semaglutide. So uh, sometimes we've started for that. Um, also for your type, type two diabetes patients who are on clozapine, um, sometimes um, the diabetes isn't managed adequately and uh, they could benefit from a GLP-1 agonist. Oh yes, back to some of the shameless plug for resources for clozapine for SMI advisor. So, um, we have a 12-week course that anybody can do. It's free, 24 CMEs on mastering clozapine. Um, I'm, I just started this course like last week. You can still join if you want. Um, it's a lot of stuff, uh, asynchronous, and then there's office hours every other week where we kind of talk about clozapine and other sometimes other psychopharm issues. We've done a number of webinars on uh, clozapine. We have a listserv that talks about clozapine. We have a consultation service on clozapine, and then you can check out the clozapine dose planner. So a lot of really great stuff on SMI Advisor. Um, and then also we have kind of a clozapine center of excellence where we talk about sort of, um, you know, modern issues regarding clozapine management. So one of the things we're working on is a video that tells people how to administer um, atropine to manage sialuria and also how to use ipitropin bromide for uh, sialuria management. Because a lot of times like, you know, people just kind of say, oh, well, here's the ophthalmic atropine, but there's actually a pretty, there's, a, there's a, a way you can use this, which is more effective. Um, okay. Clozapine REMS. Anybody in here use clozapine REMS? Yeah. All right. So, you know, clozapine REMS um, is basically part of the, it's called an Atasu system from the FDA, which means that you have to do something in order to get the medication. You have to update the REM system. And, you know, in 2015, there's a shared system that was implemented. We used to have different pharmaceutical manufacturers of clozapine, and we would have to fax the lab work to the individual pharmaceutical manager, to the individual pharmaceutical companies. So you had to know like which brand somebody was getting. Um, I had a fax machine in my house. I was one of the last people I was told by the phone company that had a fax machine in my house. Um, I had it until like a couple of years ago. It was really, yeah, it was sort of a lifestyle thing, kind of maintaining all the faxes. But now we don't need to fax anything anymore. It's all done electronically. You can kind of submit PDFs. It's really quite easy. Uh, you can use Doximity if you really need to fax something. Um, and then there were some changes that were made in 2021 that really made clozapine REMS maybe even more difficult. But just keep in mind that um, the, the FDA 
the full implementation is not um, completely in place. And the, the language from the FDA is they don't tend to object um, if there's not a REMS dispense authorization currently. So for those of you who haven't registered, go to clozapinereps.com. You have to attest that you've reviewed the prescribing information. Um, you then kind of read through a, a guide for um, healthcare professionals. You go over this decision tree for hematologic monitoring. There's also another uh, quite useful one for benign ethnic neutropenia, uh, which we can talk about if you all like at the question section. And then you answer 12 question, multiple choice question, uh, knowledge assessment, complete a brief enrollment form. The whole thing takes like 10 minutes to register. And then once you do that, um, you then have the ability to enroll or transfer patients onto your clozapine REMS list. And our job is to maintain the patient status form, which looks like this. Um, and there's actually some improvements with the patient status form than there used to be. Uh, and for the, for the attendings, we're actually able to change the frequency of monitoring based on what we think the dates are rather than have the clozapine REMS do that for us, which is quite useful. Sometimes maybe somebody will get clozapine in a residential facility. We know the start date, um, but we don't necessarily have all the blood work. We can change it ourselves. Also, there's circumstances which you can say the patient refused their clinician discretion. We don't have an ANC for this month. Uh, there's a number of ways in which they, they actually give you a little bit more flexibility. There's a lot of challenges with clozapine REMS um, and the APA and um, other stakeholders, including NAMI and NASHBID and National Council are all sort of working to address these issues with clozapine REMS. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that you know, patients do a lot of different things. They may go to a different pharmacy. They may go to a different phlebotomist. You have to look at your own EMR. You have to look at LabCorp. You have to look at Quest. Um, some pharmacies require a fax. Some pharmacies just look at clozapine REMS, which is actually all that's necessary. Um, if somebody goes out of town, you have to have somebody to help you with clozapine REMS. So there's a lot of issues with it. And I just want to talk about some changes that we are considering, um, some changes that we are actively advocating for. And, you know, some of that is just easy stuff like making Clozapine REMS website, like a little more user friendly. Another one, which I think is, would be really great, is if Clozapine REMS went from an Atasu system to an educationally oriented REMS, like buprenorphine. So this is where, like, you sit down, you take a class, you learn how to use clozapine and hematologic monitoring. And then after that, you're on your own to monitor. Um, also, you know, the, the prescriber reimbursement paradigm um, for these patients who often have a lot of other comorbidities is, uh, you know, there's a lot of extra stuff that's involved, like managing the clozapine REM system. And you don't really get paid for that. You don't get really RVUs for that. But I think that you'll see that, you know, if you do this a lot, you're really going to make a difference for people and you're going to see them uh, do well and recover. And that's um, a very rewarding process. Uh, I would also say the other thing is um, we'd really like to convene a scientific review to end lifelong hematologic requirements and then stop the monitoring after 12 months or 18 months. That way, you know, if, clozapine, if somebody who's on clozapine wants to go out of the country for two months, like they can. You don't have to worry about finding them some sort of lab in a different country um, or trying to find a pharmacy who will give them clozapine outside the country. That can be very difficult. But if that does happen, let me know and I can activate my international network of clozapine people and we can help you with that. Okay, so that's all I got. Um, I'm, we have a couple minutes, we have five minutes for questions. Oh, here we go. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Cotez. This, um, thank you for doing this presentation for us. I'm Dr. Otea, second year 
Um, one of the questions I was considering, um, and I think you briefly kind of addressed this towards the end, but a lot of the patients, particularly on the inpatient side, um, the ones that would probably most benefit from the clozapine um, are also the ones that will probably be least likely to follow up with monitoring afterwards. What are some of your thoughts on this or how would you address that? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, and was the audio of the question captured for the audience? Okay. So we, did, we looked at this one time at Grady where we had, I don't know, it was maybe... 80 consecutive starts of people who were on clozapine. And we kind of looked at what the follow-up rate was and what the predictors of them following up were. And I have to say, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that kind of went into the decision to starting them on clozapine in the first place. So it's, it's, the sample is a little bit problematic. But um, anyway, it turned out that about half of people who were prescribed clozapine on the inpatient unit made it to the outpatient setting and continued to close the bean there. Half isn't great, but if you just look at the rate of follow-up for um, inpatient to outpatient uh, in our setting, it's usually between 25 to 30%. So more people actually made it to the outpatient setting than who were not on clozapine. Um, obviously the stakes are high if somebody uh, is started on clozapine on the inpatient unit and then discharged and kind of left uh, to go into uh, rebound psychosis. But you know, I think one of, the thing that, one of the things that we do to help mitigate that on our inpatient unit is we think about starting relatively low doses of clozapine. You know, we're in this setting where um, inpatient hospitalizations are very short. Uh, and you know, I'm perfectly good with getting someone who's on 37 and a half of clozapine and continuing it, to that, you know, continuing it for them. You know, I used to be an inpatient psychiatrist and was a medical director of the unit at Grady for eight years. And, you know, there's a sense sometimes that we get of a perfectionism where it's like, we want to do everything on the inpatient unit. Let's get to somebody to 500 to clozapine, totally better, then discharge them. And I think, um, you know, increasingly, like I'm good with these sort of lower doses, somebody's relatively stable, case management, act team and then we kind of continue it in the outpatient setting. If they stop 37 and a half abruptly, there's sort of less harm than stopping 500 abruptly. I also think a lot of it is how you frame the conversation around clozapine. And uh, we have an approach called Team Up on SMI Advisor, which kind of goes through some approaches to having a discussion about clozapine, some of which I kind of alluded to. But um, it's, it's really tricky. And one of the other tri tricky parts is like, you have to have outpatient people who are also willing to continue to close the bean. That we see that all the time in the state hospital system where there's a good candidate, but like they're sort of, you know, who are we going to send them to, you know, like, and that's ultimately the barrier. So it's tough. And I think that um, the relationship is the thing that matters the most. You know, I remember when I was an inpatient psychiatrist, I was also starting the P-STAR program, you know, and I was seeing people in outpatient a lot. And um, a lot of the people we started on clozapine, I saw as an outpatient later, you know, and had that kind of continuity. That's much more difficult now, I think, where there's more sort of inpatient hospitalists and things like that. It's, it's not easy. Oh, hi, my name is Amanda Hendricks. I'm a second year psychiatry resident. And I wanted to ask you if you think that there's um, an overestimation of agranulocytosis in general amongst clinicians. Gosh, a great question. We actually looked at that um, for the bunch of clinicians across the country and uh, found that, um, you know, people who overestimate, so on average, people were usually way off on the risk of estimating the risk of agranulocytosis, some too low, some too high, even using a very generous uh, reference range, um, looking at every study that's ever been done on clozapine-induced uh, neutropenia. And the, and the people that were, uh, the people that overestimated the risk of uh, severe neutropenia were much more likely to, to kind of um, be afraid of clozapine in other ways and be less likely to use it. So I think the key takeaway number is one in 7,700 people die due to severe neutropenia. That's not, I mean, that's not zero, but like it's still a fairly low uh, risk of mortality. 
Great talk, Dr. Uh, Curtis. I had two questions. In one of your earlier slides, you mentioned after 2.8 or 2.5 years, the efficacy decreases. So if you could explain why. And the second question was doses over 600 and seizure problems. Okay. What are the ways you address that? So let's talk about uh, seizures first. Um, you know, Clozapine is associated with a number of different kinds of seizures. The most common kind of seizure people get from clozapine is generalized tonic-clonic seizure. You also see uh, people with uh, positive and negative myoclonus. That's, all, that's also fairly common and sometimes missed, particularly negative myoclonus. So there is a, an, uh, there's not an inconsequential risk of seizures that occur for any point when somebody's taking clozapine. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit controversial, but my idea, and I think other kind of people in the clozapine community idea about this is that um, once you get to a level over a thousand, the increased risk of seizures really, I think, is more significant. There, used to, there, there are people who think that once you get over a level of 600, maybe adding an AED prophylactically, I don't like to do that. I like to add an AED um, after people have had a seizure from clozapine or if their level is over a thousand and they have uh, sort of other risk factors for seizures. It's also really important to, if somebody has an underlying epilepsy, to make sure that that's appropriately treated. I think that the risk of just sort of adding an AED like sodium valproate is, um, that's also a risk, you know, and, and it can, you can see um, thrombocytopenia, uh, you see it's kind of a double whammy from a cardiometabolic standpoint. Um, so I don't routinely use AEDs uh, with levels over six, 600 or doses over 600. Um, and, and, you know, most of the time, the reason that a seizure happens is there's some sort of pharmacokinetic issue. Like somebody stops smoking and you don't know that and their level goes up and then they have a seizure and you see it in care everywhere or wherever, you know, and you're like, oh, wow, okay. Um, I wasn't aware of that. Um, so, and also like if inducers, uh, or I guess more in this case, inhibitors are added without your knowledge, that's another kind of major risk factor for seizure. Uh, to your first question, um, this is about uh, why is clozapine less effective later on in the illness? And let's go back to that slide because there's a couple of ideas why this might happen. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say, um, first of all, if the group who's been introduced to clozapine earlier or later is the same group. And then biologically, is there something different the longer you're waiting to treat TRS um, in, the, in the group that's been kind of longer delayed? Like what degree of dopamine supersensitivity is happening over time? What agents have people been getting? How much have they been stopped? Just, and then just sort of the underlying, um, I think, um, you know, sort of biological mechanism in each of these buckets, there's probably different ones. You know, I think that there's some people who are just, you know, they need um, clozapine right after they have an onset of symptoms. Other people need it more over time. Um, other people need clozapine and a second antipsychotic that has a little bit more dopamine blockade. Um, we didn't even talk about UTRS or sort of um, super resistant schizophrenia, clozapine resistant schizophrenia, which is an entirely other sort of field. I think it just speaks to the heterogene heterogeneous nature of um, schizophrenia and TRS sort of in the first place. I will also say that, um, you know, this, this finding also needs some replication. Like this, this is one study in one place. Like I, I it's a it's a hard thing to compare. Um, so I think more work like needs to be needs to be done in this area. I like to advocate for early clozapine starts, less mucking around with other antipsychotics and polypharmacy. What are your thoughts about early onset schizophrenia before age eighteen and starting clozapine? Yeah, so I think one of the predictors of good clozapine response is um, is actually early age of onset. And Judith Rappaport's cohort at NMH, NMH with uh, childhood schizophrenia, those diagnosed with um, schizophrenia at age 13 or less. 
many of these people wind up on clozapine. So I, I really think that early onset um, is, is a, a really pretty robust indicator, especially early, early onset that somebody's going to need to be on clozapine. And you have to really kind of think through, you know, is, is that is, is what we're seeing schizophrenia? Is it something else? But there is a there are a handful of people who develop schizophrenia at age 13. And many of these people just need to be on clozapine.